Hey everyone, welcome to The Writer's Journey. Today, Richard Fox and David Weber are crashing the show for an Ask Me Anything. I hear they've solemnly sworn to answer any and all questions and that they're absolutely, positively up to no good. We'll do our best <laughs> to keep them in line by asking lots and lots and lots of questions. So if you have any, go ahead and pop them in the chat and we'll try our best to get to them all. So without further ado, Richard and David, welcome to the show. Thank Hi, you. Thanks for having us. Yay! And Kayleen's here! I am here. Feeling yeah. a little better. At least I yeah. can talk better. <laughs> it's been a rough week, but how is everyone else? I'm, I'm actually, I'm doing pretty good. I actually took time to go to a convention this past weekend for, oh, for a whole day. I, in person? I was, meeting people? What? Well, I, I drove, well, no, uh, the problem is that I have a, a drop dead June 1st deadline we're not going to make. Um, it's a collaboration, and we are reduced to sending in like 50,000 words of the early draft to let them start copy editing, which I hate to do because of how it kind of nails your feet to the floor. But, you know, they're right. That's the only way we're going to get it done. So it was kind of scandalous that I, I took the day off, but my publisher was there, and she was glad to see me. She doesn't want me dropping dead working on this. Uh, but I, So, of course, I took one day off and came back with the con crud. Uh, mm -hmm. which was kind of par for my course. <laughs> you know? But other than that, I'm great. <laughs> well, and I did have laser on my left eye today. Yeah, and June 1st, I hear, is a special date for another reason. You have something else coming out on June? And um, there um, yeah, we do, um, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I got, I got mine. I Yay! got mine. Yeah. Yes. It is a... Uh, a, a special day um and i think richard and i that this is the first book written by two people who have both won the dragon award for military science fiction yep. wow. <laughs> yeah for, for, for whatever it's worth <laughs> for those and on the audio is... feed that was that was governor by david oh. and richard Fox. <laughs> the first in a series so there is more to come we're looking. We're looking at a minimum of two more, um, and I don't know anybody whose series ever gets out of hand and grows to more than they originally thought about. You know, none of mine do that, man. I, you know, <laughs> I've got to write six Honor Harrington books and then I'm done. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Sure. <laughs> and then, Richard, how have you been this week? Doing well. Doing very well. I've been. Uh... Uh, kids just finished school, so now uh, we're trying to move into that summer groove of having the three children in the house all the time and always wanting to eat. It's amazing what little kids can do. So, and then on June first, when when this book comes out, I plan on uh, doing a little uh, kind of a Metal Gear Solid run to all my local bookstores and going in there and signing all the hard copies that they have on the shelves. And I've, I've ordered signed by the author stickers to, to slap on there, just you know, just to just for fun so meet the books and the fans in person yep. yeah and I, i'll tell you the truth i that's one of the things that I, i've had like three i think that came out during the shutdown okay and that's one of the things that you really miss is the ability to go to your local bookstore and schmooze with the guys and say you know any you got on the shelves i'll sign while i'm here you know i mean it's just bleh. uh mm. Now, I don't. I don't do as much of that as I used to, um, but uh, Richard is. Richard is going to be out there breaking trail on this one, so I. I won't feel guilty this time. I'll just say, hey, no books, you know, except for the ones that were already on the shelf here in South Carolina, and none got signed. But out west, out <laughs> west, we're rocking. <laughs> there you go. So for the couple of. Viewers out there who have never heard of you, uh, David Weber, uh, who are you? What do you write? What kind of stories do you like to tell? Uh, well, I write a little bit of everything. I've got uh, straight fantasy. Um, most, of, most of what I'm known for is military science fiction, particularly the Anna Harrington series and the Safehold series, um, which are very different. One is hyperdrives and you know, all kinds of good stuff. And the other one is sailing ships moving towards uh, uh, pre-dreadnought battleships. Um, so there's, you know, kind of a, you know. Um, 
but mostly I write military science fiction. And as a matter of fact, the book that Richard and I have written is a prequel to one of my very early uh, military sci-fi novels um, set, what, we figured 300 years earlier, Richard, I think. I think that sounds right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and basically what these books are doing is creating the Terran Empire that my heroine in, in Fury Born hmm. serves 300 years later. So these are not directly about her. Although when you get done reading this book, you will understand why the planet that her maternal family comes from is ferociously <laughs> devoted to the royal family and the empire. <laughs> That's pretty cool, though, to be able to have have that established world and then be able to go so far back and then just make it even richer. I love that. Well, I wrote the, the tech <coughs> Bible for the... Okay, I wrote the original novel in this universe, uh, Path of the Fury. Um in about three weeks um and people wanted a prequel to it um and well they wanted in hardcover and they wanted sequels to it so what i did instead was i wrote an immediate prequel that was the first half of my heroine's career and it was released in hardcover because there was no way they were going to go back with a mass market and release it in a hardcover edition so the the two novels were bound together as in fury born when I did in Fury Born, I had to go back and pull out more, a lot more about the tech Bible for the universe to avoid continuity errors. And that was very useful to, to Richard and me when we started on, on this. Although we had to build a lot of the tech Bible. Uh, Kayleen is right. You know, when you go back into something like this and you start building, building out, from just what you, the ranging stakes that you put down when you wrote the book that's set 300 years later, it can be a lot of fun. It can also drive you a little crazy, but it can be a lot of fun. If you're not going a little crazy, you ain't doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. And then Richard, what about you? How did you write and how did this bromance uh, come uh, about? Well, I, I, start, I am probably best known for the Ember War saga, which is out and about, and that's I'm working on the third season of that, of that, and that, that should close out uh, what I have planned for the Ember War. I've also got um, the Exile Fleet, which is another military science fiction story. And then later in June, I have a new book called The Tear, which is, is science fiction, but it's more a first contact story that's, that's been flipped on its head, where instead of you have humans meeting aliens, rather the humans are the aliens to the aliens. And if you go up, for those of you who remember 1980s V, this story is a little bit like that. And you also see you've seen Avatar with uh, with the James Cameron version. This is also kind of like that. And I'm I'm real excited for that to come out. It's not not purely military, but there's a good deal of military in there. And then it also the audiobook is uh, performed by uh, R. C. Bray, who um, most everyone who has ever listened to an audiobook probably knows who that is. So I'm real happy to get that out. And then and of course. June first, we've got Governor Ascent to Empire coming out, and then we we've, we've got uh, definitely we're on contract for two at least two more books. Yeah, uh, David and I have talked, and we think that there's probably definitely a, a fourth book, and then a, and then a fifth book also could happen. So, but you know, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll deliver those three books, and then say, can we write some more? And I and nah. if, oh no 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 no. What you do is deliver those three books without resolving this. Oh, yes, yes. Exactly. Oh, no. Then you say, oh, look, we need to write more. Gosh darn it. How did that happen? Yeah. See, Richard, Richard's, been like, Richard's been like in the self-published world. I got to break him in here on how you how you keep the, the traditional publishers in line, you know. Yeah. And I no. hope Tony's not watching this. <laughs> but, uh, but David and I, we met in person, <clears throat> excuse me, at the... Uh, um, Archer's Rest uh, Writers Conference about two years ago, I want to say, okay. and I, I, I've been reading David's book since I was eighteen, almost nineteen years old. So <laughs> I got into uh, one of my uh, history professors in college said, "You need to read on Basilisk Station to, to learn about military leadership." And I was like, "Okay, I'll read it." And then you know, the, the, it just goes downhill from there. Like, why not? Well, good news, there's fifteen more books ahead of me. I'll just keep reading all those. So, so th that's you know. David Weber, I mean, he was, him and Robert Heinlein were like the, my first long-term, you know, long series military science fiction space opera that I ever wrote. 
or excuse me, ever read. And then I go, I go to Archer's Rest up in, in Napa, and there's David. And I'm like, oh, my God. So, but uh, David got David and I got to talking. He said, hey, um, I, I got this one series coming up. Would you be interested? And I said, tell me more. And it was not a hard sell. And David said, you know, it's uh, in Fury Born. Have you read that? I'm like, not yet, but I will. And then, and then he laid out, okay, here's, you know, the, 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 the scope of the story. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I can definitely do this. And then it was a long, a lot of talking about, you know, how does Terrence Murphy, who's the series protagonist, how does he start not being the emperor of, of the, of, of the, uh, David, I'm sorry, is it the Republic or the Federation? I know we changed it. It's Federation, Republic. Federation, right. Yeah. Uh, we didn't change it on the dust jacket. Right. Okay. So you get, you the get dust jackets were printed before we caught the fact that we had been calling it the Republic all the way through the manuscript, whereas yeah. it's clearly the Federation in, in Fury Born. So, so on now the dust cover, it's the Republic. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's a lot of talk, yeah, so there's a lot of talk of, okay, how, do, how does Terrence Murphy get from being the governor to the emperor and then kind of how does you know what's the conflict along the way and then we have everything with the Shothans and then with the league and then it's, it's you know it's fun i mean i tell you the, the most fun i ever have when writing a book is figuring out how everything's going to work and then getting the overarching plot structure once once that works like okay now i can write it. and then of course and then all along the way here comes the muse to either help or not help well so, the 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 <clears throat> How should I put this? The spinal cord of how Terence Murphy became emperor was pretty firmly established in the earlier books. The, the progress, how he went from where he was to how he became emperor. Um, but none of the details had been filled in. And the character himself had not been developed except in terms of the historical footprint that he had. So we had to, you know, with that in that respect, we were, it was almost like starting from scratch with a little less freedom, but mm. a little more guidance on where you were going with, with the characters. And um, I did like the first couple of chapters just to sort of establish where we were. And then Richard wrote the entire rest of the first draft. And then I went through, and I did, I did a fair amount of of tweaking and smoothing on on his his original manuscript, um, which was, you know, this was his first draft that he sent me, and I jumped in and started going with it. But I have to tell you that at least two thirds or three quarters of the characterization in this book, the characters who were invented and how they were developed, how they developed and whatnot, came from Richard. Um, and, um, I went back and, and, uh, reread it after we'd handed it in and everything was done. And I was going, you know what, that's, that's, that's good. And it does what a collaboration should do because it melds our, our voices into something that is distinctly not either of us alone, but mm. any of our readers will look at it and they'll see mm -hmm. our DNA in the final product okay you know i i won't do a collaboration just to increase output i will do collaborations if i'm looking at a story that i don't have time to tell by myself okay which is part of what's good this this storyline was submitted to bain at the same time in the same letter that Honor Harrington was submitted to Bain. That's how long I've wanted to do this this series. Um, and Honor just ate up so much. And I'm not complaining, trust me, but it, Honor kind of pushed other projects to the side. So I've actually, this one and the Gordian Protocol with uh, Jacob Holo um, are both projects that I pitched 25, 30 years ago and never got around to being able to write. Um, I'll do a collaboration because I hope to learn something and I've never done one I didn't learn something from. I'll do a collaboration if I have the opportunity to teach something. I've been doing this for 30 years now and I have a skill set that's going away when I go away. If I can find younger folks and, you know, 
Richard probably doesn't think of himself as younger anymore, <laughs> but I do, you know, that I can, that I can pass some of this on to. That's good. Uh, I'll do a collaborate. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Only 22 years old. Uh, but um, the, the, uh, I'll do one. Um, when I expect the final product to be at least as good as I would, as either of us would have done alone. If I don't think it's going to be at least as good as either of us would have done alone, then I'm not interested in in doing it. Um, and I've done a lot of collaborations over the year. This project that is um, I'm pushing the deadline on right now is um, is a collaboration. Um, in this case, part of the problem is that we kind of broke the mold on earlier. This is a collaboration with Eric Flint in the Honorverse. Oh, I love Eric Flint. He's okay. great. Yes. Well, see, generally, when Eric and I do collaborations, it follows along behind where the mainstream main strand of the novels have gone. It's filling in what happened over here. This time, it's carrying the strand forward. Ah. And that made some significant problems, which are nobody's fault. We just didn't see it coming. Uh, with Eric doing the rough draft, which is what we'd always done before, because he, and then of course with health issues, his and mine yeah. involved, that pushed us back to, um, you know, it's, it is what it is, and it's part of, part of what happens when you're, when you have deadlines and commitments, um, and you put on your 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 adult shoes and you go out and and you do it you know i will say that what i'm seeing so far in this book with with eric it's solid mm -hmm. it's going to be good it's just killing everybody involved to get it written <laughs> yeah richard so... and i richard and i didn't really have that kind of a oh my god oh my god oh my god because until Tony Weisskopf at Bain had had an opportunity to, you know, really look at the at the manuscript and see how it went, she wasn't sure when she was going to schedule. And as soon as she saw it, the final draft, she said, "Oh, we can drop this straight in," um, and and that's how we got the release date that we got. Well, it sounds like it's only fair because you're torturing your readers with cliffhangers and twists, and and now the writing process too can be torturous. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is fair turnabout's fair pay I, you know but, um some of the cliffhang cliffhangers i leave them with aren't supposed to be cliffhangers because i'm supposed to get i'm right back to that you know right. and then something life gets in the way mm -hmm. i mean um so this year it was uh covid mm -hmm. um 16 months before the covid it was a concussion mm -hmm. uh when i face planted into a cement floor at dragon con um and it took me over a year to really get back to into the groove writing and then poof along comes covid and that didn't help so you know poor me poor me you know um but i think i'm what i think i'm in a good place now except for the fact that we're crunching so many so many deadlines right. yeah. so for you guys with governor did you collaborate on the plot before David wrote the first couple chapters and then Richard wrote the rest of it. Like, did you guys have phone conversations or something? Like, how did you collaborate on the plot? Oh, my. Uh, we, we, we had Zoom calls quite a bit and then also traded a whole bunch of, of emails. And then I think David, I sent David like uh, my outline and Lauren's seen my outlines before. Kim, I don't know if you have, but my outlines, lots of bullet points. And it's just, it was many, there's a lot of pages. I sent to David. David remarked to me, "No one has ever sent me an outline this, like this this long before, Richard, for not for a book." But I was like, "That's generally just how I will do a story before I write it." And then David was, you know, I, I I must, David, I must give you a lot of credit. Whenever you disagree with something, you you, you couch it so professionally. <laughs> Richard, this is a great idea, but no. And then. <laughs> And then you you'll you'll put out why that doesn't work and how it will work you know the proper way and then i generally would just go yeah i should have thought of that and then and then keep going I, there was one point during the 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 outlining process where i had the idea like what if we had an animal sacrifice it makes perfect sense right here because of these other cultures who show up and david was kind of like we'll see and then he, he was actually gonna let me run with it and then i was writing the scene i'm like no, it doesn't work. I, I'll, I actually put in uh, a poem. Um, um, 
Pop Flanders Pop, Field. With the, the poppies, I remember. I'll, I'll shout out the name later when it comes to me. But it's uh, it's, a, it's a famous poem from World War One. Flan in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields. Thank you, Dave. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And, and 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 perfectly placed. Yes. In the book. Absolutely yep. perfectly placed. So when I was trying to to shoe a horn in an animal sacrifice, all of a sudden, in Flanders Field came up, and that worked a lot better. And David didn't complain when I switched it. Yeah. Well, no, no. I, it was, it was, you know, I, I was much happier with 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 Flanders Fields and sort of the the the, the vegan sacrifice with the leaf coming down from the tree. Right. Um, right. We had. Um, I can't remember which of us invented the tree. I, you know, I think it kind of well, grew in one of our I conversations. Think, I think uh, you had named the planet's name was Silver Tree, and I'm like, I took that literally. So I'm like, okay, yeah. now we will have silver trees on the planet. <laughs> and boy, do we have As silver trees does. on the planet, yeah. you know. <laughs> but I, I remember when the first collaboration I ever did with John Ringo, um, I let I said, okay, John, you can create the flora and the fauna on Marduk. Little did I know what that was going to entail. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, the, the, the silver trees are... The, the system is named Silver Tree, okay, um, and the planet is, um, uh, what did we name it? New Dublin? No. New Dublin? Yeah. New, New Dublin, Dublin. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, um, and um, I really, really like the trees. There's zero reference to them in the existing book, but then on the other hand, we don't actually spend any time on New Dublin. In the original books, so we've got a lot of uh, of uh, uh, unfilled canvas there, um, and I think the the tree. I mean, you you have to see the description of this tree. It's just, and it's somewhat bigger than an earth sequoia. Uh, it's a, it's a big tree, and it's like really really central to how these people uh, think of themselves. I mean, they're not like neo druids or, or anything like that, but. Um, this was kind of like the um, the first colony ship, the the first shuttle from the colony ship. This ship, this tree was the the tree, the tree uh, was big enough they saw it from orbit, and they landed a shuttle to get closer to it and instantly declared, "This is a nature preserve. We are going to put our settlement way, you know, way far away from it." So that. Um, but it is it plays an absolutely central role in their military personnel going off to serve in this war that's been going on for 56 years and just grinding everybody up hmm. it it really worked well um and and th see that's what happens when you do a collaboration and and the serendipity works okay um Richard and I are ooh, is that challenges or insights. I was just going to, I was trying to find a way to break in. Um, now you've mentioned um, health is definitely a factor when you're collaborating. You know, if one partner goes down, you, how do you handle that? Um, great ideas can, can come through the fruition of two minds. So with this question from uh, Sevi Scarlett, what are some challenges or insights, <clears throat> excuse me, in relation to collaborating with another author that you haven't already sort of touched on? Oh, I think one is that every collaboration is different. Every collaborating partnership is different uh, because the authors are going to have different strengths, different approaches. There's going to be ways that they work more smoothly together. Uh, the challenge is that when the collaboration doesn't work, one partner winds up carrying an unfair share of the load. That's the biggest downside. Now, on the vast majority of the collaborations that I've done, that has not been a problem. And I think the biggest plus from it is being so engaged with another mind <laughs> while you're creating the story. Because most most of the times when we're writing, we're sitting in front of our computer or whatever, and we're very much alone with our characters and our story. In that sense, we're not alone at all. 
because we're interacting with what we're producing. But it's not like there's somebody else who's standing looking over our shoulder while we're writing and saying, yeah, that works, or what about this? Even if even if you go and torture your spouse by telling her everything you did that day, you know, she's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. But it's not the same as having somebody else engaged who is both a sounding board and... Um, um, a source of sparks to to move it along, Richard. Well, it's yeah, I agree totally that every com uh, every uh, uh, co-authoring project is different. Lauren and I wrote the King of Sidonia together, and and David, we've got Governor here, and it's you know everyone works together differently. And when I sent the outline to Lauren for the King of Sidonia, and I got the back the manuscript, and I'm like. I, was like, this, I don't remember this. Like, oh, yeah. so I was like, okay. And so I think you know, one of the kind of the worries is that when you, you divide it up and when you know, the two authors agree on this is the story and then something new shows up, it's kind of like, you, you know, we, we all have our darlings that we, that we love and you're supposed to kill the darlings, but sometimes the darling's really nice. Maybe we should just, you know, punish it, not kill it. But, and, <laughs> so, and, um, and uh, Dave, when we were doing governor, I, I had this idea for it was a real it's still a good idea it, um, for how uh, New Dublin and Silver Cue system was going to defend itself from attack, and then and then uh, and David said ah, that, you know that's really good but it doesn't work with the tech so uh, we got to take that out. Yeah. Like, he had, okay. he, had, the, he, had yeah. he had this he had this wonderful guns of Navarone defense, and it just wouldn't work with with the tech that that's baked into the universe because its predecessor tech to what's available in the next book. But I actually found a way to incorporate the guns of Navarone into it with the tech. I just had to come at the final battle a different way. And it's not the way that I would have come at it on my own. Okay. Um, and that's one of those things where, you know, serendipity strikes again. You know, and you're sitting there, you look at, you're saying, "Oh, this is cool." I especially liked the the scene that that uh, Richard wrote, where uh, 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 Murphy and his XO are explaining to the owner of the mining station that they want to put military weapons on his station, and he's like, he's like, "Well." that would void my insurance. <laughs> they, say, they say, you do understand that the courts have said that, you know, losses in a war zone are not recoverable, you know, act of war, et cetera. And he says, well, what am I paying these premiums for? <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is good. <laughs> I mean, yeah. This is the relatable content we're all here for. Oh, yeah. 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 And then also, you know, it's uh, like we have, there's a character in the book, her name is Ira, and she, she's my favorite, and she and I just start off with kicking her. I, I keep kicking her for about the first half of the book. Oh, yeah. And then, and then finally she gets, you know, she gets a break, and then she's a little, she's a little unstable. And she's going to be like probably my favorite character throughout the whole series just with, with where I she think, goes. I think, I think, okay, Ira is really and truly she is an incredibly important secondary character as far as the primary plot of the novel is concerned okay she's like a she's like a beta character way far above all the gamma characters but still you know but because of her impact on murphy and murphy's son okay she is definitely a driver of where a lot of this uh, is going. Um, and for those who have read um, In Fury Born, uh, she is essentially the very first member of the Imperial cadre that, uh, that Alicia de Vries is serving in 300 years later. She's, she's where the cadre came from. We haven't worked through exactly how that's going to work, but we knew that was who she was going to be. Uh, so she's going to have a really big footprint in the in the Furyverse, um, mm -hmm. and I really like the way that that she's developed. And 
Richard is wrong. He didn't kick her. It was more like <laughs> grinding her under his heel. Oh my! Uh, oh, I mean, you know, I've I've done some bad stuff to characters over the years. Okay, um, and probably stuff this bad, you know. But I was reading it the first time around. I was going, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But you, you understand why absolutely nothing much phases her, right? mm. you know, after this. It's like, so what? You're going to turn Richard loose? He's going to do something even worse to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, speaking of Governor, today's spotlight is on Governor by David Weber and Richard Vox. For more than 50 years, the Terran Republic and the Terran League have been killing one another. The death toll has climbed ever higher, year after year, with no end in sight. But the members of the 500, the social elite of the Republic's heart worlds, don't care. Rear Admiral Terence Murphy is a heart worlder. His family is part of the 500. His wife is the daughter of one of the 500's wealthiest, most powerful industrialists. His son and his son's and his daughter can easily avoid military service and political power is ah, I read this before. I am sorry. His <laughs> sons and his daughter can easily avoid military service and his political power is his for the taking. There is no end to how high he can rise in the Republic's power structure. All he has to do is successfully complete a risk-free military governorship in the backwater fringe system of New Dublin without rocking the boat. But the people sending him to New Dublin have miscalculated. Because Terence Murphy is a man who believes in honor, who believes in duty, in common decency and responsibility, who believes there are dark and dangerous secrets behind the facade of what everyone knows. Terence Murphy intends to meet those responsibilities, to unearth those secrets, and he doesn't much care what the 500 want. He intends to put a stop to the killing. Terence Murphy is coming for whoever has orchestrated 56 years of bloodshed and slaughter, and hell itself is coming with him. Out June 1st! <laughs> Click! Order now. Or doom. Da -dum -dum -dum. I like this blurb. It feels like there's going to be something for everyone in this book. You know, there's um, the crushing weight of responsibility and there's all this conflict that's way beyond your control. And then just one guy trying to do the right thing, trying to stick to his ideals and ethics. Um, it has life in this past year and the pandemic helped to inform this story in any way for you guys. I think we pretty much gotten most of it written before yeah. the pandemic really started biting. Um, I think that probably the degree of hyper-partisanship um, that we've been looking at as a society for the last six, eight, nine years uh, informs it. But this is always how I had envisioned um, the, 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 the drivers for Murphy and where the societies had evolved to. <clears throat> it's... <clears throat> It's more of a comment on what happens when somebody is too insulated from a war in hmm. the case of the of the the five hundred okay their kids aren't being sent into the into the fire okay they can find ways to get them deferments to get them transferred get them enlisted in the army and the capital division that never leaves earth uh that kind of thing um the the burden of fighting this war falls very disproportionately on the the colon the colonial planets the outworlds um and on the poor of the of the of, of the heart worlds they're the ones who are fighting this and the 500 are all at the mall uh kind of thing um and so that's a part of it for, for i think for richard and me both responsibility is central to building a, a heroic character the fact that you take responsibility and i know that in my case almost all of my re real villains they shirk responsibility 
or they pervert responsibility to serve their own ends. Um, in the case of the 500, there's a lot of perverting what's going on to, to serve their own ends, but there's also a lot of people who just literally are so well protected from something that's been going on in the background of their lives for their entire lifetime, 56 years, okay? It's just a fact of nature. There's a war out there, and we're making money supplying the war and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, so it's no skin off my nose what happens. Okay. Because it's and out that, there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have to say that is something, you know, I grew up uh, during the era of the Vietnam War and, you know, and everything that we've done since. And that disengagement from a conflict like that is one of the most contemptible things that I can think of. It's a very natural thing when you're that well insulated from it. But whether you are involved in supporting it because you think it's a good idea or you think it's a terrible idea and you're trying to do something about that, you need to be engaged with something where your society is involved in something as destructive and murderous as a war, one way or the other. Um, and too many people over the years have dodged that, okay? Um, so if there is a political message in this book, the message is that adults don't stay uninvolved. Okay. Um, and beyond that, this is simply the story of not just one man, although Murphy is definitely the leader of the group, but he's not operating in a complete vacuum. Uh, uh, seems that way sometimes to him, but but it's it's not. But he is simply a man who is determined to do his duty. He has some <clears throat> he has a couple of personal irons in the fire. Uh, that relate to his own family history. But what is driving him is that he can't disengage himself from the fact that, people, that kids, children of somebody, are dying. Hmm. You know, there's 56 billion dead uh, by the time this book takes place. Over 50 billion dead. And to him, that's simply obscene. And he sees it as his responsibility to do something about it. And, of course, when he does, he starts kicking over rice bowls right and left, which is the real source of his problem. You know, if it were just the enemy, he'd be doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I'm sorry. I, I just kind of kept going there. Oh, no. It's, it's, uh, David and I, we are both uh, students of history. I got a degree in military history, and David more much more well read than i will ever be probably in history and so when we, we stopped and we thought okay you know we the terence murphy's question is is like you know he's one he's going to cut he's going to be a revolutionary figure and then it's like okay how do we how do we you know present him to the audience because a lot of times when you get revolutionary figures they don't it ends very badly so the the, the american revolution is one of those rare ones where things worked out pretty well for everyone when it was all mm -hmm. over but ones that don't work out, well, you can, it, most any other one you can name. Haiti. Haiti is a good example. Haiti, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so we, when, so we had to look, we thought about history, like, okay, how do we present Murphy as, you know, the, this, this sort of uh, revolutionary character that's going to make sense and be relatable? Because if he's just, if he just up and says, I'm a warlord, and then your readers, we're going to, we're going to lose him on that. So David has, has crafted a very, excellent byline for Murphy throughout the whole series in which you know, it's very good. And then um, a lot of the, the, the bigger, the angst within the book stems from that 50, the 50s, the, the years of war and the, the many billions dead and who's, and the disproportionate uh, price that people within the, the society are paying for it. And I, I graduated from West Point June 2nd, 2001. And a few months later, the great war, you know, the, the war on terror begins. Yep. Mm -hmm. And 
So for nigh on 20 years, it's still been going on. I was active duty for, for 10 years. And, you know, I, I got to see firsthand how, you know, if the, if the society is not all in for this war, it, the, the people who do fight it pay a much higher price for this. And when I was 12 months into my three month long deployment for the first time, uh, we, you know, we had, we were all set we were, my unit was ready to go home and, oh, solder is causing trouble in South Iraq. So go south to Kuwait, but stop in al and retake the city from all the terrorists. And then bumped to this other city and this other city and three extra months of being deployed my second deployment 15 months long uh so you know so i got to see firsthand just you know what these long you know these long drawn out conflicts do the people who choose to serve voluntarily now within mm -hmm. this book there's, there's you know um, there's drafting but then I, I i put it in a little uh a little twist like you can just be drafted and go serve and get out or be drafted, be well trained, and then you're kind of at the state's beck and call for quite a while. And yeah. so, and and, and 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 we do have we do have people who choose to go career after being conscripted. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Richard. No, but so you know, being able to, so thanks, great one, you know, great one, Terror. I, I was able to take a lot of this you know, angst and. You know, actual suffering that people I've served with have gone through, and been able to you know put this into a book. And I know some people who deploy. You know, um, they're they're in Iraq for 15 months. They came back, and within six months they're over again. Yeah. Mm. And then this will happen over and over, and it's just it's awful for these soldiers who are in this. It's, it's worse for their families. And then you know, by and large, people within America wouldn't even know. After yeah. September 11th, that there was a there was a conflict going on. Taxes stayed low. No one ever got drafted. It was great. Yeah. So, well, I spend a lot of time with military and ex-military people. I've got a lot of them in my readership and whatnot, and I have seen exactly what Richard is talking about. And that's part of what I'm saying when I'm saying you have to be engaged with what's going on. Um, the degree. The degree to which the military people that we have deployed in the last 20, 25 years have been not, they're not baby killers, they're not murderers when they get off the plane in, in uh, L.A., uh, flying straight home from, from Vietnam, no, you know, no decompression time, no nothing. You get on the plane in Da Nang, you get off it in LA, and there's somebody in your face screaming that you're a baby killer. The remarkable thing is that more of those people didn't get killed by people coming back from Vietnam from the way that they were they were treated when they got back. And it's not it wasn't their fault, mm. even if US policy was completely wrong. Hell, you know, most of them were were, were draftees. Okay. Today we have a volunteer military and there are too many people who have no clue what those people are sacrificing to serve in that volunteer military. But at least nobody is, or not very many people, are telling them that there must be something wrong with them to, to want to serve in the military or saying making them the 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 whipping boys and girls for a foreign policy they don't approve of okay nobody is taking it out on the troops to the best of my knowledge i don't think that we are supporting them uh as they transition back into civilian life to the extent that we ought to because a lot of these folks that, that richard is talking about who have had the month after month after month of deployment when they come home, they don't fit. Mm. They just do not fit into a civilian world. And they've got too much stuff going on in the backs of their heads. I mean, it's not like they're all of them, you know, time bombs waiting to go off because they're not. These are good, decent people, by and large, who, who have a handle on what they may do to people around them. But they're dealing with stuff inside that we're leaving them alone with way too much. Um, and I actually, some of the folks who, who read my books, you know, they've come up to me and they've said, you know, this is, 
your 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 good guys don't come home unscathed okay and that's even truer i think in governor because of of richard's input into mm -hmm. okay these folks who have been out there who've been fighting this war for forever or you know um uh, i um um uh Dewar, uh the 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 uh, military commander uh on on new dublin or uh his his father-in-law uh who has given three sons to this war and gotten none of them back and who mm -hmm. has been you know uh uh he's half his body is prosthetics uh from his own service okay um these are people who the reader can see the cost in now they're paying this cost in what has become not an unjust war, but a war divorced from any real morality on either side. Okay. Um, there's, <laughs> let's see. If you've read In Fury Born, then you already know why this war has lasted as long as it has. Okay, so if you've already read it, that's like a huge spoiler for a big part of what's going on in this book. Um, all I will say for those of you who haven't read uh, In Fury Born is there is an outside player who is deeply involved in where this, how this war started and where it has gone. Um, and the degree to which that is true will be further unpacked in the in the next couple of books uh, uh, dealing with it. So it's not just humanity is humanity and this is what we do. There's a lot of that in it because as Richard says, we're both students of history. Mm. Uh, but there are other factors um, at, at play here. Other factors that could have been discovered 30 years ago if the 500 had been interested in discovering them, um, but other factors. So your book is kind of pointing to this problem in humanity where a society is sending its sons out to a war over there and the society's kind of disconnected from it and that, the sons are coming back. But your book is also kind of fixing the problem too because a civilian like me can read the book and can get immersed in those characters and kind of get a, a, a glimpse into the truth of what's actually happening in our world. And it can maybe help soldiers coming home to read a book, to be able to relate, to be able to think through their own stories and kind of cope. Well, I know so that, your book's kind of part of the solution. Well, I, I, would, I would like to think so. We didn't we didn't set out to write it yeah. to, to do, a, you know, a, a, a tract on, you know, how we need to do better. Uh, but I think any good story, the storyteller has to be invested in things in that story that are important to him or to her. And that is definitely one of the aspects of this story that is important to, to both Richard and to me, I think. Um, and I think sometimes the writer is not always the best judge of everything that, that he put into the story. Um, because it is such an organic process that trying to isolate out, well, why did I do this? Why did I do that? You can't do it. If you try to, it kills your ability to tell the story. Um, now, looking back at it later, especially if you look back at it after some time has passed, you can see things in there that you didn't see because there were all those trees in the way keeping you from seeing the forest Okay, um, on, on your way through. But I have, I wrote one of the Honor Harrington books. I tried five times to write it in a way that didn't kill one of the most beloved characters in the series. And it just didn't work for me. And I didn't know why until after I handed the book in. And then I realized why that character had to die. And the short answer is in that book, Honor loses 75% of her family and you never met them. But this character, you knew exactly how important he was to her. And he dies saving her infant son and her mother. Um, and so he was the lens through which you could get into Honor's actual level of loss. But mm -hmm. I didn't realize that 
uh, at the time. I just knew that was the way it had to had to go. Um, and that's what I mean about when I say that, you know, frequently the writer is not the best judge of why he's doing something. Um, it's just part of telling the story. It's one thing in, I still remember in high school English classes, what do you think the author was thinking when they did this? <laughs> Probably because they just wrote it and that's just how it needed to be. Yeah. <laughs> so there's not some big, you know, bushel of, of amazement, you know, in the background. It just, that's how it went. And Kit Yoon, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Is military sci-fi fundamentally niche or is there a way to write a book with wider appeal without abandoning its core audience? That's a tough one. It's the one thing about military sci-fi is that if you put in the military aspect, you really need to get the military aspect correct. And if you don't get that right, the, the, the intended audience is not going to like it. So, if, you up. so military science fiction is within its own niche pretty much, and it kind of has to stay there. Now, granted, you can have something within the military that doesn't, isn't as you know uh, predicated on doing military things. Like, and David, I, I'm sure you know people who disagree with this. I would say Star Trek. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's in a military ship. Everyone has a military rank. But the, by and large, the military mission of what they're out there doing, not as important. So you could well, say Star Trek is sort of military sci-fi. But well, the the other side of it is that Star Trek, Star Trek's, how shall I put this? Um, its staff organization sucks. <laughs> um, okay, when you when you okay when you have a scene in which. Uh, the captain, the, 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 the executive officer who stepped up, he's fought his ship brilliantly uh, against the Borg, the whole nine yards. Okay, and and 90% of Starfleet's been destroyed, and they're going to promote him to captain and give him his own ship. And he says, he says, no, I must continue to study at John Luke's feet. Basically, the real military is going to say... I need to be a commander longer. Basically, the real military is going to say, well, you're the best judge and you're absolutely right. And there's a refuse disposal station in Ganymede orbit that's yours for the rest of your career. Because if you can't step up, you know, at, at this moment, you are out of here. We need to move with people who can. OK, that's how a real military would approach it. OK, the kinder, gentler military in Star Trek, not so much. Um, Babylon 5 had some issues with that um, because of the, the weird mishmash of rank titles uh, that they had floating around. But if you ever actually got your hands on a chart, that mishmash of ranks actually made sense. Okay. And you could see it. It was kind of like the bones of the series um, uh, that, that, that you didn't see front and center very much. Um, Tony Weisskopf, years ago, she and I were talking, and she said, you know, there's military science fiction, and then there's what I think of as militarist science fiction. And she says, very frequently, militarist science fiction is written by somebody who wants to write a military novel but doesn't have a freaking clue how the military works. Oh. <laughs> okay, and you get Star Wars. Okay. Um, and it can be a really good story in a lot of ways, but those of us who know the military are going to be going, oh my God, yes. all the way through it. Okay. I don't know if anyone saw the, the, the preview for The Tomorrow War, uh, which is going to be on Amazon in the, uh, next month. It's got Chris Pratt in it. And it's the premise is that uh, a future Earth in the future sends back people to recruit people to fight in the future. And I, I read, I got to read a script. If you watch the preview, there's some parts in it that just made my the military sci-fi author me just go, wait, what are they doing? <laughs> and it, so I, I'm I'm curious to see if, if if it deviates too much from the script that I read, but from yeah. what I saw the preview, I'm like it's not looking good. Did okay. Did do any of the three of you remember Space Above and Beyond? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, Space Above and Beyond, they're sending these guys off on a training mission to Mars yeah. with no rank structure. Yeah. They expect them to, we want you to work it out for yourself when you get there. And I'm sitting there going, these are supposed to be Marines. My <laughs> God, man. Yeah. Although it did have, it did have the all-time single greatest line in military science fiction. Delivered 
by none other than Amory. Okay. Oh, yeah. Amory, yeah. said, in space, no one can hear you scream unless it is a marine war cry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that wasn't the line I was thinking of, but okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I remember that show, and I, and I was 12, maybe, when it came out. And then they had all these pilots who they were also training to fight as infantry officers. I tunnel was like, crawlers. Tunnel crawlers. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. Do you know how much time and effort it goes into training a fighter pilot? And then you're just going to throw them into the ground where you can just <laughs> throw anyone who knows how to carry a rifle at the same time? I'm like, well, this oh, no. As a 12-year-old. Yeah. It's a twelve-year-old. Yeah, twelve-year-old Richard that. thinks. <laughs> yeah, even me, I was like, "Hold on." <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like you know, you really don't want to go watch uh, a, a military science fiction movie with me. Sharon is like usually sits like two seats down, okay, because she she says that way she can't hear my teeth grinding. Mm -hmm. um, Are you going to twenty books? Yes. Yes! yes, maybe we can watch a military science fiction movie together. We can uh, hear the grinding teeth for ourselves. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I I have to say, going back to the the question about whether or not it's it's a niche genre, and I think it is and it isn't. It depends on whether or not. Okay, let's look at the Honor Harrington books. Okay, they are clearly military science fiction, but their readership goes way beyond folks who traditionally read military science fiction. Um, and I think the reason that they do is partly because of the world building involved. But I have people come up to me and say, you know, when you start talking military hardware and stuff, my eyes glaze over. But I really love the characters and I, will, I really love what you've done with the political background. And then I have people come up to me and say, you know, when you get into all that political crap, my eyes glaze over. But I love the military hardware and I love the characters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, and, well, and, yeah. And, but what I'm hearing from both of them is I love the characters. Mm. Okay. And that is not just a consequence of building characters. It's the consequence of about building the world that is the frame in which they exist. Okay. So, yeah, I definitely write military science fiction. But the my two biggest series, The Honorverse and Safehold, both reach well beyond the traditional uh, military science fiction, this is all I read mindset. And I think most military sci-fi readers also read other subgenres. Um, I don't think that they are just totally focused in on on the military side of it. I do, like I said before, I do have a very robust readership um, in in current duty and and uh, retired uh, military, which makes me feel, you know, like okay, I'm 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 getting it. I'm getting it right. Um, but I think that one reason that folks do read my books who are military or ex-military is that I refuse to sanitize. Okay. Nobody can write military science fiction as bad as it actually was. As bad, as bad as it actually is when 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 the fecal matter hits the the air impeller i mean nobody can write that i remember colonel max said to me one time and it, it really stuck with me he said the second worst moment in any military commander's life comes when the intel was good the plan was good everybody practiced ahead of time everybody executed flawlessly you achieved all your objectives and a 19-year-old is bleeding out in your arms, and you cannot put the life back into him, whatever you do. And I said, that's the second worst moment. He said, yep. I said, what's the worst moment? He said, the worst moment is when you realize this is what you do best in all the world. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that in Honor Harrington. Because one of the reasons that she does what she does is because she knows she does it better than other people. And if she doesn't do it, somebody who does it less well will do it and get more people killed. And she pays the price for every one of the people who died. Well, Murphy is in exactly the same position in an awful lot of ways. Um, and the entire galaxy, in a sense, is blowing up in his face as, as a consequence. But some people try to write military fiction by writing it as bad as they possibly can. 
okay, making it just as horrific as they possibly can. And the problem there is that you get into a kind of numbing out of your of your audience. Um, I tend to every once in a while hit you squarely between the eyes with how horrible this really is. But otherwise, it's just there in the background, in the price that my, my characters are, are paying. And one of the reasons I did this, we were talking about being sheltered from a war. If you look at it, the American people are probably the best protected society in the history of the world. Okay, the stuff that we do, we do to ourselves pretty much. And even that, the vast majority of Americans don't have any personal experience with violence in their lives. They may know somebody who's got a, uh, an abusive spouse or something like that. But in terms of actually experiencing violence, Americans don't have much personal experience with it. So we form our views on what violence is and what it costs and how to respond to it vicariously through other people's experience, through the stories we read, through the movies we watch, through the news as it's reported to us. Well, if I'm going to write stories about violence and about people being killed and responsibility and duty and everything else, one of my jobs is to say, okay, look, this is what violence costs, okay? This is, you know, when you start talking about sending troops off into a war, this is what's going to happen to them. So you think long and hard before you send them, okay? There have been many, many wars where, yes, it was totally justified to send young men and today young women into that horrific thing we call war. There have been justifiable cases. But you make damn sure this is another one before you send them off. And that's kind of in the background of, of everything that I write. And I think that's one reason why my core readership steps beyond just the ooh, shiny giant mechs or, you know, uh, whatever um, um, school of, of military science fiction. And Richard does a lot of the same stuff stuff when you look at what happens to people in, in the, you know, when you look at the recruits passing through and where they wind up and, and everything else. But so, so I guess the answer to the, the, the question is that in many ways it is a, a niche genre. There is a core of it that will always be a niche genre. Um, but good military science fiction like good fiction of any genre reaches beyond the limitations of the label that we place on it for marketing purposes well speaking of uh, going beyond just the one genre uh kevin allen asks who are your top three favorite authors and they can be any genre i'll let richard go first oh okay um Top three favorite authors. It's the first one I'll go is uh, Dan Abnett. He writes. Uh, he's a British author. He writes uh, a lot, lot for Warhammer Forty Thousand, and he did one series called the Eisenhorn Trilogy, which still has some of the best character arcs I have ever read. And uh, I, I give that to Dan Abnett. And, I, and uh, so, uh, other next favorite author, there is. A gentleman by the name of Aaron Dembski Bowden, who also writes for Warhammer 40,000, and he did another uh, trilogy within that for Night Lords, which are the bad guys. There's no redeeming these people. These, these guys are absolutely bad guys. But during the course of reading the the, the, the trilogy, it's like this is, you, you you can you know appreciate what they've gone through, and you're like so you you can understand that. So I really liked him from like that. And number three, David, it's going to be you. Uh, I can't deny it. I, mean, it, um, I can't there, there, deny there was a couple of times when I was deployed where I was just sitting there waiting for that package of the newest Honor Harrington book to, to get to get dropped off of my bunk. So the, the so, hundred dollar yeah. bill in the plain envelope will be waiting for you. It <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, my problem is if this is Friday, it's a different set of favorite authors. Um, because it's kind of like, you know, which is your favorite kid? Oh. You know what I'm saying here. <laughs> um, the, the, the guys who... Um, the very first science fiction novel I ever read was by Jack Williamson. And Jack is not in my top tier of favorite authors, but because that was the very first science fiction novel I ever read, it has a special, still kind of a, 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 a patina of, of wonder for me. Okay. But if you start looking at the writers who shaped me, as a writer, then you'd have to be Heinlein, H. Beam Piper, Keith Lawmer, um, Gordy Dickinson. I mean, you know, the list is a long one. Um, right this minute, um, <clears throat> one of my one of the very few series that I am making the time to read uh, is the uh, Liaden series, um, um, which is uh, Steve Miller and uh, Sharon. Uh, uh oh, post post COVID mind blip because okay, I want to get say, it all the same. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say Sharon Green, and it's not. It's 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 a but there. If you haven't read them, they are fantastic. What's the name of the series again? It's the Liaden series. L L I A D E N. Um, that's how I pronounce it. Um, and um, gosh, it it's bidding fair to be the size of the honorverse uh uh by now um and i i really really uh like it um i really like uh a lot of what larry korea writes uh the monster hunters um and uh the uh the uh the hard magic the the sort of uh uh 1930s uh noir uh magic uh, but my favorite thing that he's doing right now is his uh, the uh, Son of the Black Sword uh, series. If you haven't read those, you really need to find them um, and, and take a look at them. Um, and number three, I really don't know who I would pick as, as number three because there's just so many of them out there. I mean... You know, um, Lois Bujold would have to be somewhere in the top half dozen. Um, Elizabeth Moon, although to be honest, I like her fantasy better than her science fiction, but I still love her as an author. If um, Annie McCaffrey were still alive, yeah, she'd be like number two at least on on my list. Uh, I, oh yeah, and she was big on her Harrington fan. Uh, uh -huh. which made me feel really, really, really good because, you know, Richard here was making me fill my years earlier. <laughs> okay. Well, I read uh, Pern um, in the serialized, I think it was an analog when it first came out, uh, when I was in uh, 10th grade. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it had that kind of impact. Uh, it, and it was the first time it had an enormous impact on me in at least one respect. And I'm, I'm glad that I figured this out in time to tell Annie. It was really and truly the first science fiction novel that I had read in which I had the sense there was an entire world behind it. An entire world, an entire society, you know, with a history. It didn't just turn up in order to be the framework for this, this story. If, if you see what I'm saying. And it was implicit in it from the beginning. And then gradually, as she got into Moreda and and all the way back to the founding of the colony and so forth, you got more and more and more of it. Um, but that and um, The Ship Who Sang, oh, my God. Um, and I actually have a huge weakness for her very first novel, Restory, which has, from looking at it from a writer's perspective, I can see several, you know, like like plot hole problems in it. But I don't care <laughs> because it is so great. Okay, Roger Zelazny. Oh, my God, I loved Roger, both as a writer and as a human being. So like I say, you know, asking me to pick three, I, Tough. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. Speaking of other authors, Ken Ward asks, have you ever encountered a military science fiction book you felt was a little too close to what you're writing? 
Are you mostly flattered when you see imitators or indifferent because there are only so many ideas? Hmm. I don't you, think, go Richard. Yeah, when, I, when I first started writing, I did uh, a screenplay about the Red Baron. Stay with me, this gets relevant. And uh, the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, when he was, I think he was 26 when he died, might have been 24. So, and then all of his accomplishments and everything he did in the air was meticulously recorded. So, and like, you know, his letters survived. So, you know, for, he wasn't very old when he, when he passed away, but, and, and then what is known is very well known. So I wrote a script about the Red Baron, and I took it from the point of view of well, what if he had PTSD during the course of his, uh, when he was flying, he was, he was very famous. And I put that script out there, and then the course of having that script kind of circulate in the ether, I came across uh, four other individuals who'd written screenplays about the Red Baron. And I read their screenplays, and all of us had a very different take on the the Red Baron. Even though it was a pretty, you know, the, the where you had to work was pretty small in the course of his life. We all had very different stories about it. And then the Germans went and made a Red Baron movie where he doesn't shoot anyone down, which still flabbergasts me to this day. I mean, they had the Eddie in it. Um, so, so I I don't know if I've ever looked at something and they're just doing my shtick. Because I know that you know, no matter how many stories are out there, you could look at one, you know, one instance, and then every everyone is different. And everyone's going to have a very different take on it. So, so if I ever see another um, military sci-fi book out there with a giant robot fighting an alien, I, I don't automatically assume we just call that for me. It's one of those like, yeah. well, this is interesting. Rival is fighting aliens. That's my that's my thing. So, yeah. well, I have had I have had. Um story ideas that <clears throat> I've never published. I may have talked about them in a con or whatnot. And someone else has produced a story which the 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 broad bones are very similar to what I had in mind. And I think that mostly that's because somebody else was thinking about, oh, what if I did, you know, this kind of thing. Um, I don't really think of okay storytelling is not a zero sum game okay if somebody takes an idea that i had and develops it goes in a different direction with it or whatever or even writes something that is very close to something that i had written first it may be close to what i've written but unless they're deliberately setting out to write a pastiche it's going to be told in a different voice it's going to have different emphases it's going to have different characters it's going to be a different story okay um and i'm fine fine with that um but the the other side of it is that I use history as building blocks, okay? Now, I, I tend to combine it in ways that my readers, if they're historians, don't see coming because I'll take history from the French Revolution and convince everyone that the Re People's Republic of Haven is revolutionary France when it's actually the U.S., and you don't find that out till you're like eight eight, nine, ten books into the series, and I've actually yeah. given you the Committee of Public Safety with Robert Pierre, who signs his name, Rob S. Pierre. You got you know. me. Yeah. <laughs> See, you know, everybody's like, French Revolution, French Revolution, and boom, and everybody thought, okay, this is the character who's going to be Napoleon, then I blew her up. And they're Red going herrings. like, they're like going, what, 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 you know. Uh, well, no, that would be the socialist members of Honor's family. They would be the Red Harringtons. But anyway, <laughs> um, the uh, the um, so I I do a lot of that. Okay, but you know, history is history. It's there for anybody to pick up and 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 use. Um, so I don't really worry too much about. Well, this is similar to. I, I worry more about it if it's too close for the writer involved because the way that you succeed in this is to be your own person, to have your own voice. What builds loyalty from your readership is the voice that they hear and that they build with you when they read the book because every single, every book is a collaboration. 
between the, 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 the writer and the reader because the reader is bringing worldview and, and, and mindset to the characters. And so Honor Harrington or, or Terrence Murphy is a different character for every single person who reads these books. There, 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 there are going to be huge similarities. They're going to recognize somebody else's description of the character. But that character is a different person for every single reader. Um, okay, well, if you get locked into, I'm going to write detective novels, how would Dashiell Hammett do it? Or I'm going to write a military science fiction novel. Okay, how would H. Bean Piper or David Weber or Richard Fox do it? then you're not going to be doing your best work because you have to figure out how you're going to tell the story. And so when I see somebody who gets too locked in on the imitative side of it, okay, I realize in the instant that I see that, that that writer is not going to attain everything that that writer could have attained. Okay. And I think people do it because it's safe. I think some people do it because they're basically writing fanfic and then filing off the names and the serial numbers, you know, kind of thing. And don't get me wrong, there is some really, really good fanfic out there. But if you read it, if you read it, the good stuff, the person who's writing it has developed his or her own voice for dealing with the universe in which that fanfic is appearing. Okay, they're not trying to be the script writers figuring out what Sam and Dean are going to do. Okay, this is their take on Sam and Dean and those characters. And Sam and Dean are different characters for them than they would have been for anybody else. Um, I choose... Sam and Dean, because my wife is a huge Supernatural fan, um, yeah. and she reads a lot of it, and she points me at what she thinks are some of the best uh, of it. But if you're going to succeed at anything, you have to be willing to fail at it. If you're going to succeed as a writer, you have to be willing to fail by not nailing it on your own. Now, you know, failure doesn't have to be final. It can be. It can be that it turns out this is something you really wanted to do and you just, it's not really your thing, however much you want to do it. But if you let fear of failure hold you back from trying or from trying to do it your own way in your own voice, you'll never really succeed. I tell people, you know, a lot of people like I could be a writer, I could be a writer. Well, if they're not willing to, to put it to the test to win or lose at all, okay, then when they turn my age, instead of I could be a writer, it's I could have been a writer. And they never will be because they didn't give themselves the opportunity to fall on their face. You know? That and really I, good advice. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> have to be willing to fail. Well, well, I could, I could have been, I could have been published ten years before I was, if I hadn't had that lingering. I don't want to find out. I can't really do this. I literally could have been published ten years earlier. I, I like to quote uh, John Paul Jones in this regard, and not the I have not yet begun to fight. It's from a letter that he wrote to, I believe, Ben Franklin. It was to the committee that was designing ships for the revolution. And he said, it seems to be a law inflexible unto itself that he who will not risk cannot win. And I think that is a very profound statement when you, when, when you look at it. Now, there's a difference between being willing to risk and just flat out doing stupid stuff. Okay. And I have seen folks who wanted to write flat out doing stupid stuff. <laughs> okay. On, on that note, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of punch in on what you're saying because Jeffrey H. Haskell in the chat's driving me crazy. He keeps rewriting how he's wording this question. So on Get it that out before note, he does it again. 
David, what advice would you give for writing Navy-based mill sci-fi? And I punch in there, you know, so he doesn't do stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I would say that, okay, the best advice for writing Navy-based mills is to know navies. Okay? To actually spend... I mean, I'm the kind of guy on my bookshelf here where you can't see it. Uh, I have um, the uh, design histories of U.S. battleships and whatnot. And basically, uh, Norman Friedman wrote these. And it is the design process for every battleship ever designed for the U.S. Navy with drafts and spring styles and how they worked on on uh, uh, the, the capabilities they needed in the ship. I think that's fascinating stuff. Most people are like, oh, my God. You know, I don't want to know how often they went back and forth on the thickness of the armor belt. Yes. <laughs> okay. You get yourself uh, one of these. <laughs> yes. But that's one side of, of the Navy that I'm, navies that I'm interested in. But I'm also interested in, okay, are, are you familiar with the term thalassocracy? It's a civilization, uh, a, a nation which is built on the sea, thalus, thalassocracy. And almost all of the really, what you might call humanitarian, humanocentric societies were thalassocratic, if you go back and you look. Um, and it's partly because you get this greater exposure to others, okay? But it's also because seamanship requires self-depend, self-reliance. It, it requires the ability to think and survive. You know, you're going to sail across the Atlantic to a place you've never been in ships that are maybe 60 feet long. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, think about what had to be involved in doing that. Now, Columbus was not coming from a real, you know, Republican country, uh, but the, 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 the command of the sea is in no small part what created the attitudes of places like Great Britain and, and, and whatnot. Um, so... I've always been fascinating in watching how navies work out, not just tactically, but historically. And if you understand the historical bones of the evolution of, of navies, then it gives you a huge leg up when you start designing a navy for a story that you want to tell. It's important to get the hardware right and have it be consistent within the universe that you're that you're that you're writing, whether it's our universe fifty years down the road or a historical novel or whatever, you have to get the nuts and bolts right, and you have to watch your continuity. You can't just more or less do Star Wars physics and say, "Well, what the hell?" You know, it, it works. That's how it happens. You can't Space have wizard. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't have aliens hitting Buenos Aires with rocks from another star system. Because if you could do that, if you could get here in any kind of realistic time, it wouldn't matter where they hit the planet. <laughs> that sucker would be coming in so fast, there wouldn't be a planet anymore. Uh, so you need to have that kind of thing in the back of your brain. But more than anything else, it's knowing how navies through the ages have worked. And I would say reading everything you can find that's firsthand from those periods um reading uh contemporaneous historians not just 21st century or 20th century historians looking back okay go look for some of the 19th century read read mahan um because that gets you inside the evolution of of navies and that's where you need to be if you're going to build a navy and a hierarchy and give it a mission that makes sense and if it doesn't have a mission that makes sense, why the hell did they build it? Okay. Damon, anyway, that would be my advice. That's good advice. So get your Wikipedia on and start studying. <laughs> so well, the, great, are... the great, the great oh. thing about Wikipedia is all of the other references that you can track down from it, not from Wikipedia itself. But when you get down there in the footnotes, 
that's where you get the good stuff. Yeah. And just remember, everybody, uh, that Tom Clancy, who pretty much made military thrillers famous, uh, never spent a day in uniform. He was an insurance agent. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, if you just do your research and write well. You mm -hmm. Don't let anything else yeah, get in your way. And we are we are a little over, just a tiny, tiny bit. But hopefully you guys don't mind. There was one more question in the chat that I really wanted to hit. Um, so Leo Vaccaro is asking, have you ever written something too close to real life situations that you had to back up or rewrite? And there's been there's been a lot of discussion um, recently and probably in past, but you know, really getting into you know the heart of situations and not being afraid to tackle tough subjects. So mm -hmm. I thought this was a good question. I had a, I have a character who's uh, the, the background I had for her originally was that she was a, a, a CIA analyst who convinced uh, Clinton not to hit Obama. Heard out about who? Who was Bin Laden. Okay. <laughs> so, because and this actually happened once upon a time. They they knew where where Bin Laden was, and they were going to you know hit where his compound was. But then some analysts said, "No, look, there's swings there. There's kids. You can't do it." And then Clinton said, "Oh, fine. We won't we won't hit where Bin Laden is. We'll hit some mildly uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, abandoned training camps in Afghanistan. You know, pretty toothless gesture." And then after that, then after that, Bin Laden was like, "Well, I guess the U.S. isn't serious. I'll go ahead and put 9/11 through." So and so this character, you know, she her daughter was killed on 9/11, and because and then she traced it back. She's like, "Oh no, this is my fault because I made the decision to convince Clinton not to do that." And and when I had that in a book, and it was a little too close, so I I, I backed it up and I made it a little more general where she was. You know, she had made a, a wrong intelligence decision, influenced the wrong decision, and then went, and her daughter was was killed from that. So that's that. That were I backed up a little bit because that was too, you know, it was nine twenty years ago. That was still that's too too close. Too on the nose. That was okay. too real. So I, I, I switched that a little bit. If you read um, "Flag in Exile" in the Honor Harrington universe, I actually put an author's note into the book because the book had been written it had already gone through copy edit the whole nine thing whole nine yards before the oklahoma city bombing and i have a, a bombing which is actually carried out by one of the uh the stead holders the, the in essence they're they're all ruling kings in a planet-wide empire they, they each have their own little kingdom where not so little in some cases and he did it purely as a political ploy and a bunch of school kids were killed when it happened and i said in my author's note you know at the time i put this together it was the most horrible thing that i could think of and it didn't occur to me that an american citizen might turn around and do something even more horrific you know before this book was released i don't think probably that I would back down because, you know, back out um, because of something that was too close to immediate. But that's partly because I've been doing this for a long time and I would probably get a degree of, of clearance from my readership because they know that I'm not just reaching for a cheap moment or, or whatever. That would be one of the things that, that would concern me about something like this. Um, the other side of it is that I try not to get too uh, down in the weeds in terms of linking what I'm writing to a specific, boy, did you guys screw up moment in in current history um for example um i don't have i have i have like three or four characters in the honorverse who the care who the readers have met who are gay okay but it's never been important to the storyline 
And if you look at it, you know, I tell you about my character's sex lives when their sex lives begin impacting what they're doing. Otherwise, that's their business. I'm not going to be a peeping Tom, you know, kind of thing. But I am very much opposed to inserting characters of specific types in order to make sure the boxes get checked. Um, I did a, a short story for uh, an anthology, uh, Give Me Liberty Con. If you haven't mm -hmm. read it, find it and read it. It's really good. And Jane Linskold and I developed it into the next novel in the Star Kingdom series, which Bain has now. Um, and there's at least three characters in there who are gay. And it's significant to who they are and, and what they do. So, yeah, it's front and center. But I'm not into checking off boxes, and I'm also not into refusing to step on somebody's toes if I think that's where the story has to go. Um, and I tried to figure out the other day why so many of my Facebook posts turn into dumpster fires. <laughs> okay. And, we might yeah, know well, a little bit about that here. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think part of it is that my readership is very diverse. I have folks who are pretty pretty far left and folks who are pretty far right. And what they have in common are my books. So when I put a post up, they see it because they're looking for posts from me. And that's how they find each other and engage in Mortal Kombat. Um, you know, I mean, that's that's just the way, <laughs> just the way it works. Uh, but it's like I could, I could sit back and I post something from the Babylon Bee and the next thing I know, people are eye gouging in the aisles over it. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> you know, God. But yeah, I can hear the theme music in my head. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just you know, and and the other thing is, I try really hard on on Facebook, even when I disagree with someone, to bear in mind that one of the problems we have right now is it is no longer possible for somebody simply to be wrong. If they don't agree mm -hmm. with me, they are evil. They're not just mm -hmm. wrong. Okay. Far, you know, and God forbid it should be that they have a, a valid, workable, different path to the same goal. It may not be the one I choose. I may not think it was perfect, but, you know, it would work. OK, you know, we can't possibly allow that. They must be evil, nasty. You know, you know, they want to burn down all the cities or they just want the corporations to have all the money. There's nothing in the middle. <laughs> OK, anymore. And I'm feeling kind of lonely out there, but I feel like somebody has to has to be there. Well, um, we'll join you. Oh, thank we'll you. We'll join you thank there you. in the middle. Well, I, We're I, there I, with you in the smog. I think, I think there are a lot of sane people left. They just don't have the, the, the decibel level of, of, the, of the, the, the Looney Tunes. And trust me, they come in every imaginable flavor of Looney Tune. Um, and I've met a bunch of them uh, over the years. Um, and it's kind of like some of me don't want to talk back from the edge of the ledge. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ugly, but you don't want to. You just... Poof, you know, but you know, I just rip the warning labels off, let it sort itself out. Situation, yes, 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 yes. It's see, see that funny plate in the wall with the two little slots. Go stick a finger in each of them and see what happens. Yeah, you know? I just, you know, I, I, I think that if the books do anything at all in terms of, of political statements. It's to suggest that you can be a rotten, nasty, uh, privileged conservative. You can be a lunatic liberal. But the sane people are the ones who are out there not listening to any of the extremes and actually trying to get on with fixing the problems. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think it's a whole lot more complicated than that. Yeah, but what I'm hearing, if you're if if your story definitely calls for hitting those tough subjects, those, you know, especially if they're winding up with things happening in the world in your community, yeah, um, make sure that it's needed for the story, yep. and you know, do it with a sense of decorum. You know, you have these these core characters 
that have purpose, have reasonings, they have their own faults, they have their own strengths. You have your overall world and what it needs, its weaknesses, its strengths. So if it's yeah. needed for the story, then... Yeah. That never, 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 ever subordinate the story to topicality. Okay? Because stories that have legs don't depend on topicality. Okay? And if you start doing that, then you're twisting yourself out of shape. Um, and besides that, um, things change. Uh, Keith Lahmer, uh, not, I'm sorry, H. Bean Piper, uh, was one of the very first science fiction writers to put women into uniform, unless you're going to count, um, oh, what's her name from Buck Rogers in the the original Buck Rogers story? I think uh, uh, the Colonel uh, from the from the TV series was, I think, a corporal uh, in the original stories, and she was basically a grunt in in the front line, which is incredible when you think that this book was written, I think, in the 1920s. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Piper, but you know, he was putting women in in uniform. And there's a scene in the Uller Uprising where one of these female noncoms is briefing the general, and she's tough as nails, you know, and she's using pistol cartridges for markers on the map, you know, the whole nine yards, and it's really going well. And then there's a point at which the fact that Piper was writing this too soon betrays him, because he refers to her as the girl sergeant. And it's because he was so far ahead conceptually of where the language had gotten to. So if I were editing uh, Piper today, I would actually be guilty of bottlerization there. I would just drop the, 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 the gendered pronoun. I would just drop it. And then what you would have is the sergeant said. And so all of our exquisitely sensitive 21st century antennae would not go, ooh, <laughs> how could he do that and see what he had actually done you see what i'm saying and and i think that that's if if a story has legs if it's going to last it's going to outgrow its particular time frame um huckleberry finn okay i don't care what anybody says okay mark twain wrote one of the most powerful anti-slavery novels ever written okay um and if people will just stop trying to throttle it uh, and, and let kids read it today, I think they'll see exactly where he was coming from. I've got a, I've got a line in the, the upcoming book about, uh, for Tear about uh, hoarding toilet paper. And it makes perfect sense within that story. So I really hope that joke lands. So people aren't going to go, I you just making fun of Cooper Corona. No, 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 it makes perfect sense. There you go. Take risks, but be firm in knowing that it works with your story and the current scene and own it. Yeah. All well, right. if, it, if it doesn't work for you, it's not going to work for anybody else. Okay. That's now, true. it may work That's for true. you, and you will find that you have a core audience of 11. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's you, you have got to write the story that works for you first. Okay. And regard it like that that block of stone and you're going to carve away everything that doesn't look like your story. Okay. Um, and don't worry too much. Okay. When I wrote, when I wrote path of the fury, I had sent it off to Bain books. I'd sent the manuscript off. And like eight months later, my sister-in-law Sue sent me a filk song that could have been the written from the novel or the other way around. I had no idea that it existed when I wrote the story. Okay. But I mean, it is, if you want something to read, to, to have playing in the background while you're reading the book, that's the song you should be playing. And if you want a book to read while you listen to the song, that's the book you should be reading. I just, you know, it was eerie. Uh, when, Accidental when I got... synergy. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and you know, but like I say, you know, if I had if I had known the song existed, I very probably would have written the book anyway. Okay, because it was the story that needed to be written. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that I'm going to, if I can find the time. Okay, I'm going to use an old Harry Chapin song as the <laughs> inspiration for a fantasy novel or a novella. Um, 
but I mean, you, you get story ideas from weird places and you have to be kind to them uh, when, when, when they get there. And you have to be respectful of them when you write the story. Well, gentlemen, thank you for coming on the show and sharing your time. And um, Richard, on behalf of the whole Keystroke community and our audience, we want to thank you for your service and for those years and your family and just everything you did over there. Thank you. Absolutely. And with that, everyone You're in first, the live everybody. chat, thank you for joining us on this extra extended writer's journey Sorry. Uh, show today. <laughs> I mean, we have both Richard and we have David. I mean, it was bound to happen. It's just what's it's just what's going to happen. You're actually uh, getting out a good twenty minutes short of what I usually do. To <laughs> well, I I have to because I have to leave in in nine minutes to go get my daughter from school. Ooh, so, ooh, okay. <laughs> so I have to leave. Okay. Um, I mean, y'all can keep going, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce. Uh, I gotta anyway. feed Nana. Yeah, <laughs> she I, has to eat sometimes. Okay, I'm the cook. Oh, okay. there you go. So, yeah, well, Sharon, the first the first uh, Thanksgiving that we were married, I was working away, and Sharon comes down, and she's sitting on the other side of the bar looking over, and I got my apron on and everything, and I'm just basting turkeys and everything else. And she says, well, barefooting in the kitchen. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> And on that glorious <laughs> note, I love that. <laughs> to everyone in live chat, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to check us out next week uh, for live on Mondays. Um, Walt Robillard, Robillard, if I can talk anymore, Tuesday mornings, really super early. When I no longer sound like I have a frog trying to eat a horse in my throat, I will be <laughs> back Wednesdays for story time. Um, we have the stuff going on Thursdays with other things that my brain is like completely just dumping out of its mind space at this moment. And of course, Fridays where we talk about reading, writing and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, the writer's journey.